Today is Jeff Fritz. Jeff, how are you, my friend? Hey, good to see you, David. It's great to be back. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm talking to you because I happen to see you virtually speaking at a user group. Was it in Tulsa, Oklahoma the other day? Was it Tulsa? It was virtual, it's, so it's hard for me to know. But so, somewhere you were talking, and you were talking about .NET place. Aspire. Yeah. And .NET Aspire is a, is a really cool thing that I'm just now learning about. In fact, I had a okay. conversation very recently with Scott Hunter, who you know. Never heard of him. And uh, <laughs> he speaks very highly of you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and um, he uh, he gave me the basics, you know, what .NET Aspire does. So the folks watching at home, you if you're if you're unfamiliar with .NET Aspire, go back and watch that one, and it's um it talks about this idea. Well, I'll tell you what, just give us the the elevator pitch. What is .NET Aspire? So .NET Aspire isn't a framework, but it's a tech stack. It's a stack of different tools, libraries, and functionality that you can you can kind of put around your application system that provides four different sets of capabilities. That, that we all want in our cloud native apps. We want observability. We want to know what's going on inside this thing. We want resiliency. We, we don't want it to fall over easily. We want it scalability. We want to be able to scale up and handle massive crowds of users coming to use our application. And of course, we want manageability. We want to be able to rotate keys and move things around easily on the cloud without having to think too much about it. So that's what Aspire does, and it delivers it through a series of different things. And where most folks see and, and think all of .NET Aspire is, is this really cool dashboard that we have in our developer toolkit that lets you manage all the resources you configure in your .NET Aspire application system, be able to observe them, be able to get various metrics using open telemetry coming off of them, distributed logging and tracing, and be able to click through and manage and interact with all those components in a uniform single point entrance to your developer workflow. Okay, that's a really good uh, overview of it. If folks want more detail, go back and watch the Scott Hunter interview right before this one. Uh, but uh, we touched, when I was talking to Scott, we talked touched briefly on deployment. We talked mostly mm. about developing locally, which is really cool. It, 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 it okay. wires up everything for you. And then we use tools like uh, AZD to generate some deployment artifacts. We didn't go into a whole lot of detail. I was wondering if you could shed some okay. more light on this process. Sure. So what's what's great about .NET Aspire is that it's, like I said, it's this stack that wraps your application. So when you build, the, the output of it is actually a series of JSON files that, that are your manifest, that describe, here's the structure of my okay. application system. At that point, tools like AZD, the Azure Developer Command Line tool, can pick up, orchestrate, that, that JSON and decide how to deploy that out to Azure. Now, that's a very Microsoft first approach to the, the way that we build and deploy with .NET Aspire. Because Aspire outputs this JSON and, and it's hidden from us, that JSON uh, output when we use AZD, um, there's other tools out there that other folks have built because .NET Aspire is open source that will allow you to build and deploy for, for AWS and also to build and deploy to your Kubernetes stack. So you can generate all your appropriate configuration files to install and deploy and run on Kubernetes if you want it as well. So you have a bunch of different ways that you can orchestrate and deliver and run your application in a public location that hopefully other folks will come and visit and use your application system. So AZD is, is the first class tool that we want folks to use when you go and deploy and run on Azure. There's other tools for other folks, clouds and local installations, if you want those as well. Okay. Well, let's talk about AZD then, deploying to yeah. Azure. Tell, tell me a little about the process. What do I, I've got my application running. It works amazingly locally. I'm hitting awesome. my local host colon one, two, three, four, five site, which is calling out to an API at local oh, yeah. host four, five, six 
that, that does me no good in the cloud because the cloud can't access my mobile host. Um, no. What's step no. one? So when we start thinking about deploying and pushing out to Azure, of course, you, you get your hands on AZD. There's an install for that in WinGet for you to bring down and get configured locally. You initially initialize, that sounds weird. You initialize your application using the AZD init command, and it will analyze your Aspire configuration and decide what parts it needs to allocate for and puts down some initial configuration files. After that, most folks just run from the command line AZD up. And that does two things. Um, it actually does three things. It builds your application, provisions appropriate resources on Azure based on what you've configured inside of your .NET Aspire app host project. And then it deploys. It'll actually take the various bits of configuration to your applications and applies them to those resources it allocated. So it now, actually creates some resource. So if I have a, a oh yeah. Redis cache in my application, it'll actually create a Redis cache service. If I have a database yep. in my application, it'll create that database in yep. Azure. Oh yeah. So now there's there's different configuration options when you choose, let's, let's pick on Redis cache for a minute. If you just say add Redis cache in your app host, it will allocate a container and use just Redis cache inside that container locally on your development machine. Mm -hmm. When you deploy that out to Azure in that configuration, it'll do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You'll get a container running in Azure container apps that has Redis installed. Mm -hmm. And that's great. However, there is Azure Redis service. You may want to run the Azure Redis cache service out on Azure. So you can actually put extra configuration into your app host that says, when I'm deploying, use the Azure Redis service. Now, that could mean that you'll see cost savings. That could mean you'll be able to manage and deliver higher throughput because you can scale up that Redis service to different sizes and different amounts of memory and network allocation and redundancy and nodes in the Redis cluster. And you can decide how to provide all that configuration from inside of your Aspire app host configuration. There's even options so that you can say, publish this as a connection string, and you can go manage that Redis cluster in your own way. Maybe you have a VM that you're running, you're using the Azure Redis service, you wanna hand that off and let that can be configured by something else. You can just supply that connection string at deployment time and AZD will handle and pass off that connection string and not actually allocate any Redis resources for you. Gives you a bunch of options there for flexibility of how you want to deploy and run your application. Okay, well, how, how does uh, this deployment know like the names of the services I'm creating or the locations, the regions, things like that? Good question. So initially, when you run AZD up, it's going to ask you a series of questions. What region do you want to run in? Um, it, make sure it has your Azure subscription configured, and it'll ask you for a resource group name that you want to use. Mm -hmm. So you provide a resource group name, and then for some of the services that it's going to deploy because you want them out there to secure and manage, and they're kind of background things, it'll generate names for those. These are things like your container registry that are gonna contain the, the output of your project compilation that gets delivered in containers and will run in Azure Container Apps. So that yeah. container registry, it's gonna generate a name for that. Yeah, you don't need to know the name of that. It just has exactly. to be unique. Yep, same thing with a key vault. It's gonna allocate a key vault to store all the connection strings and API keys, those things. It's gonna allocate a little key vault for that. And you don't really care what the name of that is. It'll generate the name for that. However, for things like your web application or other API services, or the name of the database that you allocated, it's gonna generate and deliver the same name that you specified for the name of that service inside your app host program file. So you named your web service web. Yes. It's gonna name a container app web 
inside that resource group you specified. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, and this is uh, the output of AZD up is some JSON files, correct? Well, when AZD up runs, it, the output of that actually is it, it publishes provisions and, and launches your application on Azure. Well, that's awesome, except that I want to repeat this process. I don't want to go through oh, AZD yeah. up every single oh, yeah. time I deploy no. it, every time I make a change, and all those questions again. I want to plug it into some pipeline. How does that Absolutely. Work? So when you run um, the initial AZD init, it'll write down a markdown file. It generates a little markdown file called nextsteps.md. And if you take a look in there, it actually says, if you want to configure this with continuous uh, deployment, here's where you can go to get a GitHub action script, a Azure DevOps script, and copy and place that appropriately in that service. Hmm. Fantastic. So you place those scripts appropriately in Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions. Right now, I'm preferring GitHub Actions. That's, okay. that's where I like to work in. So I can deploy that GitHub Action, and then there's a pipeline configuration command that I can run. AZD pipeline config, three words, and it will prompt you for all those configuration parameters that you want used during deployment. And it will appropriately create those um, GitHub action secrets in your pipeline so that the next time you commit, it has your GitHub action allocated appropriately. It has your uh, secrets, your connection strings to third-party services and whatnot, all allocated and deployed into your key vault properly so that it will automatically continuously build, deploy, and keep your application up to date. That's pretty cool stuff. That is cool. Um, I struggle with the GitHub action scripts. So to have something that generates it for me and gets it 99% of the way there, and I might have to go in and tweak one or two things because I want to add an extra unit testing script. I love it. Love it. Yeah, some uh, some deployment scripts are not intuitive, and an extra space here or there can ruin an entire script. Like said. David, you're you're telling me you don't enjoy the wonder that is YAML? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, enjoy is probably not the right word. Uh, <laughs> I tolerate it. Uh, okay, but it is nice to see that they have have uh, at least the the structure of it created for me. Sure. Uh, because that's that's difficult to memorize. The tooling helps a little bit, you know. IntelliSense helps a little bit, but oh yes, it's it's and not definitely definitely not intuitive, for sure. And what's what's great about the way that AZD generates and runs and delivers all this content for you is, we we know that Bicep is the language that Azure uses to allocate and provision resources. All of that Bicep uh, uh, text content is generated for you and is hidden behind the scenes. But if you want to tweak it, right. there are options inside um, both .NET Aspire and inside of the AZD tooling that will allow you to generate that BICEP script and save it to disk so you can modify it to add in whatever extra special configuration your system needs. And it will then use that script to deploy and run your application out on Azure. Pretty awesome. cool stuff to allow you to extend from the defaults. You mentioned earlier that there's tooling to deploy to other clouds or just to Kubernetes yeah. in general. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Sure. So um, there's a tool that was built by folks in the community called Aspirate, A-S-P-I-R and the number eight at mm -hmm. the end. Um, it does the exact same thing that um, that AZD does, except instead of generating BICEP scripts and executing them against Azure, it generates the appropriate uh, uh, kubectl files, the YAML files to configure Kubernetes and allows you to push that into your favorite Kubernetes cluster. Hmm. So the, the difference, of course, will be it, those Azure-specific services you may have requested Things like Azure Storage Service, Cosmos DB, you're not going to be able to deploy those right. to a Kubernetes service that is running somewhere besides Azure. Right. Um, I notice that you have a site here. 
I'm not sure if I'm saying this right. Aspirify.net? Aspirify.net. Aspirify.net. Thank you. There you go. Because it's .net right? Aspire, of course. I should have started mm -hmm. with that. Uh, what does this do? What, tell me about it. So I had this idea as, as .net Aspire was happening and, and launching with .net Conf 2023, right? That's where it was announced, that folks are, are, are going to want to follow and learn more about this. And I wanted to put together just a little news hub. Um, it, it might be similar to other news websites you see out there that, that capture and have a little snippet and provide links off to other places. But what would be really great would be if we built this with all .NET 8 technologies and we use .NET Aspire to orchestrate and deliver it. So it's literally a website about .NET Aspire Built with .NET Aspire. Built with .NET Aspire. I like so it. there you go. And and um, we've been learning about that as I've been building it on my uh, live streams on Twitch and YouTube to let folks see this is pretty easy to do and work with. And it just kind of adapts to the features that I need to add into my application system. So it's not just a website that's out there. There's an administrative feature where I want to upload new articles, right? I've, gosh, there's a, there, there's a new podcast from this guy, Giard, about .NET Aspire. I want to oh, load that onto good. the website. <laughs> yeah. So when I load that out there, there's going to be a thumbnail that goes with that. But I don't nice. want to depend on your website delivering me that thumbnail every time it's requested. That's going to introduce a little bit of latency. And your thumbnail might not be in the size that I want to present on the website. So we build a little microservice. When a new article is created, we're going to save that to the database. We're going to throw it into a search engine so it can be indexed for searching later. And we're going to grab that thumbnail image, pass it over to a little microservice API that runs inside the cluster of containers that we built. And it will automatically download the image, resize it, put it in the format that I want, and save it back out to my blob storage on Azure. Nice. So all of that done and, and piping back and forth, piece of cake, easy to do with Aspire because everything's running locally as we're developing and we can see here's a queue. It's pulling off information about, in this case, a thumbnail, and it knows how to process and handle it. So it works out real nicely and easy to pick up and, and learn from. Nice. Uh, so as you built, you said you built this using uh, .NET Aspire. What's yep. was, what was the biggest challenge building Aspireify.net? Um, the biggest challenge was I started this while we were in some of the preview versions. So as we were going through and and working on this, I ran into a little bit of a challenge where the domain name I wanted to be able to apply the domain name when the site got deployed. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, uh, when AZD deploys, it generates these BICEP files that describes your resources. So when it went to deploy that Azure container app that hosts the website that I want to answer on Aspirify.net, that domain name, it needs to include that information inside the BICEP configuration. So okay. this is where, and, and I, I hinted at it earlier, foreshadowing, um, this is where for Aspirify, I had to generate those BICEP files, save them to disk, and then reach into it and configure so that it knows exactly where to get the certificates and the domain oh. name and how to specify that so that for ingress purposes into that container, it knows to respond to requests for Aspirify.net. I see. So we had to go and customize that little bit of configuration. It was a little bit tricky because it's, it's not something that's available in the box with the APIs, mm -hmm. but because we know how to generate those configuration files, wasn't too hard to bolt on to the process. Uh, very cool. Is that, is that still an issue today now that uh, .NET Aspire has G8 or was that something that was in the early previews that you had to start we, with? We still need to do this templating in the early previews. The, the templates were very rough to work okay. with and there was even a point where that between two of the previews, it was completely broken for me and, and we had to go through and figure out what the issue was. Um, got it resolved and, and it deploys now properly. 
but uh, it's something that you can you can read about in the documentation how to customize I and see. deploy. Is there anything we haven't covered about deploying .NET Aspire apps that you feel is critical? Um, some of the initial configurations that you might get for your resources aren't exactly what you're looking for or what you need. And you can customize them. There are some commands that you can pass through during in, in the, there are some commands that you can use to customize in the uh, program CS file of your app host configuration. Mm -hmm. So you can do things like the default Azure storage uses um, a global redundant storage, okay. which is a little bit more expensive than if you wanted the, the less expensive, the budget friendly local redundant storage, the LRS versus GRS versions of storage. Things like that you can mm -hmm. configure um, on the fly as it gets deployed to Azure. Not hard to do, but you have to do a little bit of digging to find that in the documentation, and you need to be aware of it during deployment. Um, some of the other things that folks are going to see and that they need to be aware of is when you're deploying out there, make sure you turn on that ingress. You need to actually expose your website mm -hmm. to HTTP traffic. And if you don't explicitly say expose this service to external HTTP traffic, it, it it doesn't open the door so folks can visit your website. That bit me for a little bit because I completely forgot about it because I was mm. so used to deploying on things like Azure App Service, where oh, you don't really have an ingress configuration. But when we think about deploying with container apps, there are things like your website that you want to be servicing external requests and your internal API services that are doing things like the thumbnail management you don't want to be exposed. Yeah. So being able to turn that on and off is something that we need to go back and remember as developers and put our DevOps hats on so we know how to deploy and manage those things. Good advice. Um, yeah. And you are talking about this on your Twitch screen it's currently, right? Yep, we're, we're building, talking about it. Um, I have a weekly series that I'm teaching on the uh, .NET YouTube channel on Wednesdays. I'm, I'm teaching that. If you're watching this sometime way in the future, late 2024, early 2025 <laughs> or later. early June 2024 right now as we're recording this. Yeah. So if you're watching it it's sometime after that, hello, future people. It's great to talk to you. You can find the recordings on the .NET channel in the Learn C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz playlist. We're building a, we're, we're taking a simple blog that was just reading markdown files out of a folder and rendering them on screen. And we're turning it into a, a full fledged CMS system using .NET Aspire and, and lighting up a new .NET Aspire feature each week as we go along and add more and more complexity and sophistication to the blog engine. Nice. Uh, Jeff, as always, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, David. It's been great talking to you. Hey there, friends. My name is Jeff Fritz, and I've been building awesome cloud native applications live with some of the best technology and my friends.